Here we go. Now this is Cottontail, 1940. Bro Rabbit, Bugs Bunny. It's about a trickster. So it's a very tricky arrangement. Two things we can go over. One thing always important when you're playing music this in time is the time. The time is the most important thing. The layering of the bass and the drums and how the top part relates to the bottom part. And that we get a sense of urgency. In this one that we just played, sometimes the top is not urgent enough. So it's just to say to just for Paul, just be more urgent at the top. And bark the melody patterns with the drums because the drummer is performs a function of playing in the sixth time, ting, 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 like in an African cowbell situation where that's the lead instrument. At the same time, the drummer is also the percussionist. So like in a symphonic orchestra, when percussion, a run goes, so if we go, ta, ta, di, 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 pra, ah, drums play answering parts and they also set up the band. So they make, grap, Pa pa da da pa pa pra uh uh pa da pa 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 pra. The drummer can set it up by hitting the downbeat or off rhythm that's not in the part, or can punctuate it by playing with the brass. Generally, at the discretion of the drummers, it's not going to be in the part. These parts have accents, and the accent is an indication of what the brass section is playing generally. In the old days, if you didn't have, a, if you lost a drum book, you would just give them the lead trumpet part, and they would play along with it. So we have to get that balance right and make sure we're not. Logging down. There's a lot of people playing quarter notes. The guitar is playing quarter notes. The piano is playing quarter notes. Drum is playing uh, a, a, a six pattern, but a version in the a, a, a version of the quarter note. But it's but he's playing a six pattern, and the bass is playing quarter notes. So there's got to be a right of way. The guitar is presiding over two and four. The bass is presiding over one and three. The drums are on all of the beats. The drums, the bass generally is pushing the tempo. The drums generally will drag the tempo, and the piano is in between, acting like a referee. That's just general rules about swing. It doesn't mean it's always true. It's just what generally happens. This piece shows you the difference between the voicing of a small band and a big band. We start with the small band. We could have played that a little better, but it, it wasn't bad. We got to let us see the trumpet solo over the sax pad. Uh, we, got, we, have to, we have to make sure in the saxophone section that we can hear the trumpet solo and let us see. We weren't, we, we were playing good as Forte, but we weren't listening for the trumpet. Good, the trumpet solo is great. He has a mute on. There's nothing he can do to really make us, make us listen to him. Now, the brass section, all of us, let's watch a little deep. Let's not clip the notes too much. That time we're playing too short. So we play short. We, it makes us, it just, we want to hear the, here we go. So it, it let a D. A letter D, we want this, this little interlude. This is an important interlude in the arrangement because it's leading way to what will eventually become Now, a good thing to do with, a, with your band is to show them how thematic material is related. We're going to do that right now. We're going to play from letter D to letter E. And then we're going to skip to... Uh, we're going to skip to letter... Letter W, letter D and W. One, two. Oh, not not not. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Not straight. Not. We're gonna stop, and then we're gonna do W. Okay, we're stopping. A oh, one, two. A oh, one, two, three. <laughs> now, the the difficult thing for the, of of this is, we have to make sure we land on the downbeat of three together. Okay, we basically did it, but that's something to look at for your band when you have these contrapuntal lines. Now, let's listen to W, just the first four bars. One, listen to how this is related to that earlier thematic material. One, two, a oh, one, two, three, uh. Uh, It almost seemed like you don't want to just play two. Uh, <laughs> let's do the last four bars of it, y'all. Let's go four before X and just stop at X. Four before X. Now we're going four before X just so we can hear the thematic relationship. One, two, a one, two, three, uh. Okay. Now we have, a, we have a tenor solo. So the band is, is going up and down. Then we have a voicing for the trumpet section and the clarinet at letter G. We didn't play it as well in, in balance as we could have played it, but it wasn't bad because this voice. Normally, the, the, it's unusual for the clarinet to be voiced that close to the brass section, but it's something about the way this, this voicing works that you actually can hear the clarinet 
uh, on top of the trumpets. For our trumpet section, we just have to be aware of where the clarinet is because the clarinet is leading through G. We come back to the saxophones, the clarinet leads up to letter I. After that, the brass are, are on their own. So we, we have a short call and response. Da, 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 we're playing tags and buttons at the end of solos. Know where a tag and a button is. Then we go back to the tenor solo. Rhythm section has to maintain the momentum. The tenor saxophone is Camille is playing is just important. She's being very idiomatic, kind of the way that she's playing it. You have a lot of latitude to play, however you want to play it. It's good to have that type of vocabulary. Uh, it's, it's just, it, by this point, there's so, so much in the saxophone vocabulary. Uh, it's important to take every piece of music and learn how to speak another aspect of the vocabulary in your style. And the more, voc more styles and vocabularies you understand, the, the more enriched your own style will be. It's kind of like the palate of a chef or or anybody who does things, a, a palette of, a, of, a, of, a, of an artist. The more you have at your disposal, the more successful you'll be at communicating with more people. The brass did a great job at letter K of playing exactly with the lead, a really balanced chord that cut off on four. And it's important to recognize also with your band when things are exactly right. Sometimes we rehearse and we only want to say what's, what's wrong with something. It, it, it just, there's always great things and always things that are not as good. And it's good to recognize the great things and to say, okay, this was fantastic how we want to do this one. For the tenor soloist, when the brass comes in, you have to be aware of what, what the background is, the volume they're playing, and what type of material you're playing. Okay, though they're playing whole notes, if you're playing fast, you're going to be heard. But you just your choices have to be affected by what the background is and also by what is coming in after you. So when you get to M, the brass are going to play a light clip passage. All of that was pretty good. Uh, we played good coming in. We just have to make sure we don't. It says it says light and clipped. I don't know if we want to clip it that much. It was too clipped. So I don't I don't I don't think we should clip it that much. But as as always, when you're playing, we discuss stuff. You still have to follow lead. If the lead clips, you clip. If the lead does not clip, you don't clip. Because when we start playing, we're not going to stop and say. When we finish playing, we can discuss it. I don't think it should be that clip. Then the Barry solo gives us another. This is a kind of interlude section. The Barry is going to play a short, eight bars, and then the piano is going to play. So we're going with the ensemble is breaking down, and then it's going to build back up. As it starts to build back up, we get to let a cue. It's a very difficult sax solo, which was excellently played, and it'll be played even better the next time we play it. Up and down. You don't want this kind of thing could easily be mechanistic. We have to remember, the rule of how we play these things and achieve a naturalness is follow the lead to a T and allow the feeling of the lead and the naturalness of the lead's lead to inform you so then the lead doesn't have to drive the part like dragging along people. Make it so that that lead is just comfortable and the lead should feel like I'm soloing. I want Sherman to feel like he's playing a solo. I don't want to do 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 And that's achieved when the following, when the parts that are underneath actually give themselves over to the lead part. Now we get to you, to you, the brass, the saxophones. The brass have got to be fortissimo, like they were, because now we need the arrangement to lift off the ground. The saxophones got to come in even louder, bibbidi, bibbidi, bop, bop, because they're at the crest. They follow the fall of the brass. The brass go, bop, bop, bibbidi, bibbidi, bop, 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 bop. Now they go up, bop, 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 bop. So it's a dialogue with going up and going down. The saxophones come down, the brass go up. So it continues this call and response. A crisis point in this arrangement is W. Four before W, we're going to have problems with that. That's when we have a convergence of thematic material. Always the, the most difficult thing is contrasting things where the band plays two different types of syncopation. So it's worth it to rehearse this. Let's go, let's go three before W, just with the brass. Just the brass, three, three before W slower. One, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> with, with the rhythm section. One, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> okay, now, let's hear the saxophone part. It's three before W, a one, two. I want two, three, four. Don't play, don't play the trail. Let's just go on the syncopated part. One, I want two, three, uh. Okay, they're doing, they're 
they're going to kind of hemiola. One, two, three, uh, 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 uh. Okay, let me hear the brass and the, and the reeds. Now, this is going to give the band a chance to hear the cross rhythm with the rhythm section just playing quarter notes. One, the brass and the three before W. Listen to these cross rhythms. One, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> Okay, now when we get to W, this is this is kind of like the the high point of the arrangement because all of the call and responses, all of the rises and falls meet in this part. Something that is good to do that Professor Rodney Whitaker just taught me is to play through this very slowly so the band can hear each chord. Okay, we've played it a million times, so we can, our ears are acclimated to it. But let's play through W. Do 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 boo di 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 and try to identify each sound that we're playing. When a band can identify sonorities, it will play them in tune. When not, it just becomes a mass of sound that falls under nobody ever knows what that is. You never want that philosophy. You want to say, we're going to rehearse this slowly enough to understand what it is. So let's go. Do, 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 do. At this tempo. One, two, one, two, three, four. chance to hear what's going on with the chords. Yeah. It's, uh, it's also good to, to have the horns play without the rhythm section sometimes. They say Benny Goodman always did that with his band, and he would always talk about the importance of keeping rhythm and long notes. Sometimes we play long notes and we lose sense of the time. So uh, that, I think that's, that's a good practice. Even though I just called for the drums, I shouldn't have called for them. Uh, what uh, you might have seen us do earlier was to go over our parts and look where we're gonna play short and long notes. We have to come to a consensus of what it's going to be so we can actually play together. Uh, and we'll try it a certain kind of way, and if it doesn't work, we'll try it another kind of way, but l as long as we are together. Because a lot of time, all those markings are not on your parts. It's something that you just learn how to do over time. And you have to make a decision. Usually it's on the lead alto player, but it can be on anybody who's, who's actually leading the section. And just come to a consensus. Uh, also, we change some things dynamically. Uh, you might have seen us uh, looking at, at, at what I had written down on my part and then they copied it on theirs. At letter Q, instead of us playing at forte and try to stay at forte at that at point on the saxophone solely, we br we're bringing it down to a mezzo forte so we have room to go up and down instead of just staying loud. And then we come back up at you. Those are the kind of decisions that we make. And every band has, you know, they can make whatever decisions are best for them. So I think this is best for us. So that's what we're doing. I'm gonna say something about the rhythm section. Well, actually the bass part. This is a transcription. And uh, if you bass players uh, check this out, the bass player doesn't play the A or E string on this entire song. Uh, he might play one note on the A string, but everything is played on the D and G string. And the reason for that is because of, um, they were playing acoustically and uh, the bass sings better in these different registers of the bass. So just take note of that as you play this. I mean, eventually you're gonna create your own bass line and you can create your own walking bass line. But as you learn this, figure out the actual register of your instrument and understand why these notes make a difference when you're playing acoustic. <laughs> 